I wanted to take a look today at some items made by Kevin Wilkins of Wilkins Grip. He does work out of Germany and he's probably most widely known for making aftermarket grips for Benchmade and Spyderco knives. Uh, but he, he does make his own handmade knives. Uh, and I recently learned that he quit doing the aftermarket scales for knives. He said there just wasn't enough demand for them. Um, and since they are pricey, you know, there are so many great knives available right now um, at the price point where just his scales would be selling that, that people just weren't buying them as much. So he's quit making those. Uh, but he does still make his custom uh, fully handmade knives in, in a few different models. And I've got one of those here, Leaf Storm 9. So we'll take a look at some titanium scales that I've got for Benchmades that he did, and then the Leaf Storm 9 as well. So this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy video. Probably you'll see there are a lot of knives, and there are some you can't even see here uh, that I'll be doing like just some comparisons to. As a little bonus, just um, because of what this knife is, this Leaf Storm 9, it has a 2.75 inch blade. So if you're looking at that, you may like smaller knives or you may be somewhere that requires you to have a blade less than three inches. So I've got a lot of knives here that may be alternatives to the Leaf Storm 9 since it is both expensive and can be very difficult to find. I, I just got lucky. I've been wanting one of these for a little while and got lucky and, and stumbled upon this one for sale. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is take a look at just, just some of the scales because that's probably what people know him best for. Um, and I've got them on three different Benchmades here, Benchmade Griptilians. These are all titanium. Uh, you can see this one has an inlaid G10 in, in the swimming pool green. Um, I bought all these scales and installed them on the knives myself. Um, two of these are the Doug Ritter grit or, uh, blade shapes with the M390. And this is, this is a more standard blade that you're likely to find on a Griptilian. Typically, these knives came with uh, very cheap FRN plastic scales. They just, they feel cheap. Um, they're just, uh, they, they look bad. They feel cheap. They're, they're just terrible. Uh, but it allowed them to offer the knives at a pretty decent price point. Um, and they're still a very functional, you know, blade or handle material with the blades and everything uh, being very functional shapes. Uh, but this is what originally came on this small Griptilian were these cheap scales and I knew when I bought this knife they discontinued these Doug Ritters Benchmade did and I, I bought one of the last ones I could find online new and I bought it knowing that I was going to install these titanium grips so I also bought these new from Kevin Wilkins and, and did all this setup myself. Um, I greatly prefer the feel of his grips. Uh, he also did the grips in full G10 and in aluminum uh, but all these are titanium and then this with the inlaid G10. I, I think these grips feel a lot better in hand than the factory grips did to me. There's just a little more meat on the end of it, and I like that a little more. My pinky kind of hung off the end of this one. It just It's not that it was uncomfortable. I just I just preferred this. But that's the small grip Tillion with his titanium on there. The fit and finish on these things is beautiful. Uh, this knife right here, this small grip Tillion with these titanium scales, I feel is a really, really excellent EDC knife. Um, it, it wasn't cheap. The knife knew, I think it was about $130 after shipping and stuff. The scales themselves, after shipping and everything, I think they were like $170, $180, something like that, because they ship from Germany and he all his prices are in euros and stuff. I can't remember exactly, but, but pretty much you're looking at about $300 for this knife as it sits right here. And it did come with the scales and the orange G10 backspacer. You had choices in color of backspacer with this. Um, all of these knives also, as we look at them, they have aftermarket clips. Uh, these were made by a guy. I got them on eBay, all, all of these clips for these three knives. And uh, they're titanium. I really like them. They just, uh, they match the knives really well as far as just uh, like some of the shapes and, and finishes and stuff. Uh, just a random thing. I, I can't find that guy anymore. I don't think he's doing clips, or if he is, maybe not doing them on eBay or something. I, I really don't know, but uh, those clips are all on there. But anyway, getting back to this knife, I think this is really an excellent EDC knife. The blade shape is good. The size is good. This is about a three-inch blade, uh, so it's a little longer than the Leaf Storm and some of the other things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, but fit and finish, awesome on here. I, I love the look, love the feel, and I really liked his products. Um, I think the first set I got was actually this one. I got this set used on Blade Forums. Um, somehow I stumbled upon this Doug Ritter, this larger one, 
and I installed these scales on it. This one has a silver aluminum backspacer. Once again, fit and finish and everything on here is great. I will say though, in comparison to the smaller one, you can see this is much, much thinner. The, this is a beast. Um, this one, it's a little bit heavy, but I don't think it's terrible. It's, it'd be a perfectly fine EDC knife. Um, this big one though, I'll tell you, it, it, is, it is heavy, it's bulky, it's not one that I would probably choose to carry in my pocket. Um, I probably did a time or two right after I installed these on here, but it's it's just not one that that I think you're going to want to carry around a whole lot. Uh, beautiful action on it and everything. It looks nice, but it is very big and very heavy. This one is a little bit better in the weight department, but not not hugely better. Uh, because it does have some milled pockets and then the G10 on there, but it's still a heavy, bulky knife. Um, I do love the look of this one. This one has a black, I think it's just a plastic, um, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to zoom that, backspacer here. Um, I do wish that was aluminum or G10 or something, but I, th I think that's just a plastic. But anyway, his if you can get your hands on some of his scales for these Benchmades, they're, they're really nice. Um, like I said, the, these are going to be a little bit bulky, so this might not be something you're going to want to carry every day. But for the small griptilian, if you can get anything by him, the, the G10, the titanium is my preference. I prefer titanium to aluminum. Um, I think a lot of people probably do. But this guy right here, I would, if you can get your hands on him, I'd recommend picking up a set of those scales. If you can get them for a reasonable price. Now that he's not making them anymore, people are doing that whole thing. Well, it's, it's scarce, rare. You know, give me three times what it costs, you know, when you could get them. So you may have to deal with that now on the market, uh, but highly recommended for that small one. And here's the information card that came with the knife. Uh, you can see the model on it. It's a Leafstorm 9 folder blade steel. It's using a CPM S30V, uh, Rockwell hardness there on C scale, 60 to 61. A fire anodized titanium for the scales, and then this was made in December of 2018. So now that we've taken a look at the scales, we'll go ahead and take a look at the Leaf Storm 9. This is a fully handmade knife by Wilkins in Germany, as he probably puts there on the blade. Um, he's made different versions of the Leaf Storm. He used to do a frame lock on this, and as I understand it, and I could be wrong about this, but just as I understand it, he started using the axis lock once Benchmade's patent ran out on this locking mechanism. Um, so, you know, these are these are axis locks from Benchmade. And once that patent ran out, he switched and started doing this. I could be wrong about that. Maybe he had, you know, something else going on that he could he could legally do that. But this is what he uses on the current version of the Leaf Storm. He calls it a sliding bar lock, but, yeah, I mean, it's an axis lock. Same design, uh, Omega Springs and stuff in there. I haven't had it apart, but... I'm assuming there are Omega Springs in there because everything looks the same as it does on the on the Benchmade designs. Um, so this is a knife with a 2.75 inch blade. It may be one that you're looking at uh, if you live somewhere that requires you to have less than a three inch blade on your folding knife, or if you just want something that maybe not everybody else is gonna have in their pocket. Um, could be different reasons for that, but we'll take a look at the knife. Uh, we'll go over some stuff I like, some stuff I don't like about it. We'll do some size comparisons and some comparisons to other knives that I think maybe, uh, if you're looking at this one, maybe other knives that you want to take a look at. So first, let's take a look at it for size comparisons. Here it is next to a standard sized Sharpie pen. And a couple of knives that I'm sure most knife enthusiasts have had a chance to handle have some contact with. This is a Buck 110. See it's well used, but the Leaf Storm is much smaller than the Buck 110 in length, but if we look at them in width, also the Buck 110 is smaller, but, and we'll get into this, this, this guy's pretty thick for how small it is, because the Buck 110 is, is a pretty thick knife too. Uh, and then the other knife we have here that's a common one is a Case Trapper. Uh, this is actually a case hobo. It has a fork for that second blade in there. As you can see, the leaf storm is shorter than that case trapper. And thickness-wise on this one, 
the case trapper is much thicker, but we're dealing with, with a completely different knife here. I mean, this is a layered knife with two blades and liners and scales and all that. So there it is next to just some common common objects that you, you probably have some contact with. You can get it for a size comparison. So let's get into some things that I like about this knife. Uh, first of all, I like the overall look of it. Um, I like the general lines and the shape. I just, I think it looks nice. I like this dimpling that he does, that he did on the on the Benchmade scales there. Um, it's just adds a little pop to the knife and I like that. Um, I like the sliding bar lock. Uh, so I've been a fan of the Axis lock for years. Uh, the first really good knives that I got when I was in college, uh, way back in the late 90s, early 2000s, was a Benchmade 710, uh, which had the Axis lock on it. And I've always liked the Axis lock. I, I have owned and do own many Benchmade knives that have that locking mechanism. I've never had an Omega spring break on me. Uh, a lot of those are just collector's knives, but I have carried and used a lot of those knives as EDC. Um, I'm a fan of that knife, and I say that now probably five of my Benchmade Omega Springs will break, I don't know. But I'm a fan of that locking mechanism. I always have been. It leads to a really smooth action um, and a, a solid lockup in my experience. So I like the sliding bar slash axis lock. Um, the opening hole, I like it. It's large. It's very easy to get a hold of. I don't have to search for it or anything. It's just right there. Easily get my thumb in there. Uh, the action is also smooth enough where I can just pull the axis lock, lock axis bar back or sliding bar, whatever you want to call it, and just do that as well. But that opening hole, I do like that. I think it's a good method uh, to use to open the knife. I, I like thumb studs. I like flippers. I like all opening mechanisms. I do prefer manual opening mechanisms, you know, a hole, a stud, something to straight up flippers. That's just a personal preference, um, but this one works pretty well. It has a retaining screw here to keep the pivot from spinning. I think that's pretty neat. I like that. Just kind of a uh, innovative type of thing. I like to see that when you're spending money on knives, see something that's a little bit different. Um, I already mentioned that the action is smooth on it. I So the ergonomics can be a plus, a like, or a dislike on this knife. For me, they work pretty well. I'm not going to say they're great, but, but I like them. Uh, so you can get a good three-finger grip on this and then your pinky's hanging back here. Uh, when you do that, your thumb rests right in that jimping. I find this to be a little awkward feeling. There's just a lot hanging out here outside of my hand. Um, I'm not hugely fond of that, but it works. Uh, when I choke up though, and I get four fingers on the knife, which you can do if you just get up here on this hump, this actually feels pretty good to me. I like that. Like I say, it's not great, but but I like it. Um, you know, it's, it's not one that's the best ergonomically that I've ever held, but it's not terrible either. Um, so overall, it's okay. I like that. I do like when knives are more pricey. I like to see innovation, and I like to see little little touches, little details. And one little detail that I definitely like is this, I think it's brass, but whatever this pivot collar is, I definitely like that. I think it, it adds a little pop to the knife. Um, I like the way it looks, and I, I'm happy to see that on there. One other thing I like is that this is not a common knife. Um, you may see, as we go through some of these knives, you're gonna see some stuff that, you know, you're not gonna see in the pockets of a lot of people. And I, I like having stuff that, that not everybody has, and I, I'm sure that a lot of us do. Uh, but that's one thing that I do like about this one. They, they are not easy to get, uh, new or used. They don't show up on the used market very often. Um, I've missed a couple of these. I've been trying to get one used for a while, um, and I finally got lucky and snagged this one. Uh, the last thing in the likes column on this one for me is that it is not a flipper. It's not a frame lock. It's not on ball bearings. That just seems to dominate, well, it not even seems, it dominates the knife industry right now. And I like to see something that is different and does not have those, those attributes. It's just nice to have something different in your collection. So that pretty much goes over the stuff that I, that I like about the knife. So now that I've talked about some of my likes on the knife, I'm gonna get into a list of stuff that I don't necessarily like on this knife. And, and there are quite a few things here. The first, which is a big one to me, is the fit and finish on this knife. Uh, this is a handmade knife. 
and in handling it, I was really surprised at some of the things that I've seen on it. I just, given its price point, given that it's handmade, I just, I would not have expected to see some of these things. And I do want to give a footnote here. I did buy this knife used. It has been used by at least the previous owner. I don't know how many people have owned it in total, um, but it has been used. So some of the marks and stuff you're going to see on here are, are just from normal use, but there are some things on here that are, are manufacturing things that I just didn't expect to see. Uh, the first thing that I'd like to bring up is that this knife, the edges on this knife, like in here, the edges of these dimples, they're, they're kind of sharp. I mean, they're not shaving sharp. They're not going to cut you, but they're noticeably sharper than the edges here. The, the edges of these dimples are much smoother. The edges inside the scales are much smoother. And I was kind of surprised at that. Um, I would have liked to have seen those maybe blasted a little bit more, um, or I don't, I don't know if you blasted them at all, but I, I would have liked to have seen those, those edges um, not be so sharp. I was a little bit surprised at that. Um, and then there are just some marks and stuff. Now, as I said, this knife is used. So as we look at this, you're gonna notice some dings here. I don't think those are from the factory. I think it was probably dropped or something at some point. Um, so don't don't pay attention to those. But you'll notice that there's a like a line that goes around. And I'm not sure what that's from. Um, it just, it, it jumped out at me. Uh, and it doesn't go all the way around. It's just, it's just in some areas there on this, on this part of the scales. It's a little bit difficult. I'm trying to catch it in the light here. Um, but it's there on both sides. There you can kind of see it. Uh, that's just something in the finish, something in the machining. I don't know. You can't, I don't know if you can, no, your finger, your fingernail does catch on it. Yeah. And you can see it down in there too. So it catches a fingernail. It's some kind of a mark from the machining process. Yeah. Fingers definitely catching on there. A um, little bit surprised to see that. Um, the plunge grind, the plunge line here, I noticed this right away, is uneven. So here you'll notice that it's on, so on this side you'll notice it's kind of a gentle slope and it kind of terminates almost right at the edge of the scale there. Uh, this one is is much more blocky. Uh, it, it just, I noticed that like right away and you can see it as that light catches it, how, how different it is on both sides and I'll flip it over here so you can see it there too. Um, you know, not a functional thing, but I mean this just from a handmade knife in this price point, I didn't expect to see something like that. I would I would have liked to have not seen a what I would consider a defect. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, I noticed it. Uh, here on the pivot screw and once again this one since this knife is used, I cannot 100% say that this is from manufacturing. Uh, this may have been something that was done to it by a user, but it's a pretty perfect circle around the, the torque screw there. Um, and it's it's not even, but it's just some sort of a circular mark. If that did come from the factory, that, you know, is a little bit of a bother. I, I, I don't really like that. Um, the jimping is also a little bit rougher than I would have expected it. Just the, just not the jimping itself, like the aggression of the jimping, but you can see like some machine marks in there. Uh, that was something that caught my eye as well. Um, and one big thing that caught my eye was this nipple on the bar, on the locking bar. I mean, it, so I, I don't know exactly what was done to, to make this, but I, I'm just going to assume it was, it was a lathe. Um, and it's like the tool, they, they just quit before they got all the way to the center and got that little nub cut off. And it's, you know, sharp edges. I noticed that right away. Um, that to me is, is, I just, once again, all these things, I just wouldn't expect to see this on a knife that costs as much that's handmade. That does not appear on the other side. In fact, it's almost the opposite. There's almost a little dimple on this side of the locking bar. So I don't know if, I mean, I can't imagine that that was left there for a purpose. So it just, it just seems like something uh, that was forgotten. Uh, something else that you'll notice is the screws that attach these inner liners to the scales are not flush with the body. That is not exclusive 
actually this one's pretty good. This one on the bottom is, is pretty flush, but oftentimes with these axis lock knives, I wish I grabbed a 940. Oh, here you can see it. Oh, you can see it really readily on that. Um, these screws often, and my 940, my Benchmade 940s are the same way. These screws stick out. Um, I don't like that. On my Benchmades, I'm like, well, yeah, all right, whatever. It's a, it's a production knife. Um, I don't like it, but whatever. On this thing, I did not expect to see something like that. I would have expected would have expected that to be, you know, fitted better. Um, I think that kind of goes over all the fit and finish stuff that I noticed on it, but it, it's, it's a pretty good list of stuff, honestly, um, that, that I had found to be, uh, undesirable on a knife of this price point and, and being handmade. Uh, so we'll get into some other stuff I don't like. One thing is the side to side play with the knife. So when the knife is closed, you'll notice there's quite a bit of wiggle there. I, you know, some knives do this, some knives don't, whatever. It's, it's just, uh, like I said, and all this goes back to price point and everything. You know, if I've got this on a $125 Benchmade, eh, whatever. When I've got that on this, which these are like 500 euros and up. I mean, these are, these are expensive. It, it's something that jumps out to you. Now, when it's when it's open, when it's locked, that wiggle is not nearly as evident, but it, there is still some side to side play there, and it seems to kind of vary with how how uh, much force you use when you open the knife. Uh, sometimes it's it's more wiggle, sometimes it's less, uh, but it seems if you open the knife very slowly, which I like to do, there's more wiggle right now than there is if I take it and kind of force it open. Now there's less. Um, and I know that, that that probably means the lock bar is getting further up on the blade tang or something, but I just noticed that side-to-side -side wiggle. And to add to that, I have tried to tighten this pivot. And the pivot is as tight as it will go. I, almost like, I, and I don't know if there is a pivot bushing or something in there. I've not taken this apart. I don't know that. But it feels like my Sabenzas where all of a sudden it's as tight as it's going to go, and that's it. Um and it, you cannot eliminate the blade plate. Like on these, if you can keep tightening these and you can get to the point where the blade won't even move because it just keeps pinching, pinching, pinching down on the blade tang um, and you can adjust the action on them as you like. Uh, this one, it, it, for whatever reason, it goes down in there or it, you tighten it up and, and that's, that's it. That's as far as it's gonna go. So side to side play, just something that, that popped out at me on this one. Um, ergonomics is something that I mentioned as a, as a like, didn't love it, but I liked it, but I can really see where this knife would not be for a lot of people. I have medium sized hands. I wear medium sized gloves. Um, and I, I can see maybe if you had larger hands, this would not feel as good. Um, or if you had smaller hands, maybe it wouldn't. It feels, it feels good to me, not great, but I could see where just this design may not feel good to to some people so so keep that in mind uh, if you're if you're taking a look at one of these um, and now I'm going to list some things under the don't like that are just preferences to me just personal preferences that I would have liked to seen changed or different options or something uh, first one is the pocket clip this is a fine pocket clip it's functional it does what it needs to it looks fine it's got some scratches on it from Carrie um, but there's nothing objectively wrong with this pocket clip. I am just not a huge fan of deep carry pocket clips. I would much prefer, and in fact, I did install this pocket clip on there. It actually looks really good on there. It has this orange peel type finish that goes well with the orange peel type finish on the scales. But because this, and it's it's the same on, on, his, on his scales here, um, because this is uh, so, these screws are so far down this pocket clip just didn't work. There's a huge amount of the knife sticking out of the pocket. It just, it just, I don't know. I just didn't like it as much. So I ended up swapping the clip back. Um, and I may explore some other um, pocket clips for this thing. It should be able to use any three hole, you know, Emerson Benchmade pocket clip, I would think. So I, I may look into some other options for that. Pocket clip, personal preference. I'd have rather seen something where I could have mounted the, the clip um, a little further up there. But it, I mean, it looks like he designed it to work with his deep carry pocket clip and it works well for that. So that's why it's just a personal preference thing. It's not an, obje an objectively bad thing. Backspacer on here. It is, uh, I'm assuming this is G10. 
I personally would have liked to seen a metal backspacer back here, uh, titanium, something to add a little color pop or something back there. Uh, the knife, this knife is already heavy. It's a beast uh, for how small it is. So, you know, adding a little chunk of metal back there is not really going to affect that much. And I just, I just think it would have looked better. Uh, personal preference, I'd like to have seen um, a metal backspacer back here. The blade finish. So this is kind of like a working finish that you might find on a hinderer um, where they've like bead blasted it and then stone washed it or something. That's what it feels like to me. So that it does have a rough, a rougher texture. And while I like the look of this, um, and it, it can, it, you know, it'll get scratches and stuff, but it, it kind of has some of that stuff from the factory. So it'll, it'll kind of hide scratch as well. And I do like the aesthetic of it. What I've seen with hinderers and other people's experiences similar is that there are, there's, it kind of makes the surface porous. So it can trap moisture and such, and it will lead to some surface rust if you're not careful. So you got to make sure to clean that off. And that can just happen from carrying it in your pocket and getting a little sweaty. Um, so that's something you got to be careful of um, when, when you're considering a knife with this, a knife with this kind of blade finish. The scale finish to me, and once again, this is personal preference. I'm not hugely fond of it. It's fire anodized. Um, it's got kind of like that rainbowish color to it. It's okay. Um, I bought it because you can't find these things. So if you want to try one, you, you really almost got to kind of take whatever you can get. Um, I would have much rather had one of them with just this plain gray matte finish. Or um, so the, he does make some of these with like a, a bronze scale. I would have loved to have one of those, but man, I'll bet that sucker is really heavy. Um, so just, just the blade finish, personal preference. I would have liked to have seen something different, but it, I mean, it's well executed. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, the, the dimples, I actually would have liked to seen this pattern continued on the axis bar. Just put a dimple on each one of these and we could have gotten rid of this little nipple thing that's going on here. And it looks like this one already has a tiny shallow dimple in there. Um, so I would have just liked to have seen the dimples on, on there. Another thing for me that would fall under the dislikes is a lack of jimping on this blade spine. Uh, so here you've got the jimping. If you're doing your three finger grip there and the jimping here is, is fine. It's functional. I like it. You move up here, your thumbs move in here. And I mean, it's a wide blade. It's not you know, your thumb's not like flying off the side or anything, but I would have, I, the, the missing jimping, the, the lack of jimping there is noticeable to me, definitely. So like when I get this knife and I've got my, it's, it's just naturally has a nice four finger grip. The jimping goes all the way up into the blade and it just, it feels so nice. The jimping on this knife is very, very nice. So when I get down this one, and choke up on this, I noticed that jimping not being there and I would much rather it have some jimping on the back of that blade. Another one under the dislikes column is this area right here. So I saw this in another video review that somebody did, how this sticks up. And I hadn't really thought about it until he mentioned it, but it actually does, it, it kind of, I don't know, it, it doesn't look great in my opinion. So most of these other knives on the table that heel is hidden. I'm trying to find like all these other ones, and we'll you know we'll see these in a, in a little bit. I'm trying to find any of them where this heel is not hidden. They all are. Um, so you know maybe maybe look at that when we go through them. But this heel being up here is is a little a little weird. Um, I I do wish that was flush within the scales. Um, another thing in that area that we'll take a look at here, and I'm just going to pick one at random. You'll see this on a lot. Oh, this is a good example. I like when the knife makers do a rounded area here for the stop pin to enter. Here it's just flat. I don't know if that actually makes a difference functionally or anything. You can see the line where the lock bar is engaging there on the back of the blade tang. Um, I really like to see this rounded area though, and a lot of people do that. Um, I'll do it. Oh, those these both have internal stop pins, so they're not going to do it. But anyway, you saw it. You saw what I'm talking about on the. Uh, on the zero tolerance there. So I, I would have liked to have seen um, a rounded area there. And maybe because this is exposed, he didn't want to do that because if it's rounded, it creates like a hook 
So, well, but yeah, the, you're pulling it out of your pocket, so the hook's not going to catch anything there. Maybe when you're trying to get it in your pocket, the hook will catch on the pocket material. I don't know. Uh, that's just something, you know, un under a preference thing that I would have liked to have seen, not, not an objective dislike, I guess. So here's another one in the um, dislike column, maybe under personal preferences, but given how small this knife is, a 2.75 inch blade, it's rather heavy. Uh, we've got 4.40 ounces on the scale here. It's also rather thick. So, um, you know, it can it can be a bit of a pocket hog for uh, how small of a blade you're getting on the knife compared to some other ones that, that we will take a look at here. Um, so something I may have liked to seen on this one, uh, just given the price point and everything, there is some space where there could have been some milling. So he's milled out the scales to get the liners in for the lock sliding lock mechanism, sliding bar lock mechanism. Uh, but maybe some milling inside the scales would have been nice because this one is thicker and, and heavier. So that would have been nice to see on here. That pretty much covers my dislikes on the knife, which are, are kind of lengthy. Um, still, it's a neat knife. It's a neat design. It's just, it's not going to be for everybody. I can tell you that. So... Let's take a look now at some other knives that fit into this sub three inch blade area that, that I think you should be looking at if you're looking at this one. Um, some of these will be some, some knives that are different. Some of them may just be a functional, like you just gotta have something less than three inches. Um, so f let's just start, oh, we'll start up here. First one, Curtis Nano. This is a very small blade. The Curtis Nano um, is a two inch blade is a two inch cutting edge. And this is the one, I, I the office building I work, work in currently does not, you have to have, if you carry a knife, it's got to have less than a two and a half inch blade. So this is pretty much the biggest knife that I carry. And I carry this one pretty often uh, where I work right now. Uh, Curtis knives are good, high quality. They're gonna be in about the same price point as the Wilkins. Uh, this is a titanium flipper on ball bearings. I do like though that I can use the hole the elongated hole to open it. It opens very well via either one of those methods. So Curtis Nano, and these come in all, kind of like the Wilkins, they come in all different kinds of um, finishes. Um, I've actually got one inbound that has, um, it's an, I think it's called an oval tack, and it has sort of oval cuts in the scale, different colors, uh, different anodizing on the pivot and the, and the hardware and such, and the clips. So um, this would be one I, I'd recommend taking a look at. This, I really like this. We talked about Hinder a few minutes ago. This is a Hinderer half track. It's probably my favorite knife from Hinderer. Uh, this is a 2.75 inch blade. Uh, the biggest downside to this knife for me is that it is a flipper only. You can't open it. I wish this thing had thumb studs or something, uh, but I would definitely be taking a look at the half track if you're looking for something in a sub three inch blade that's still fairly big and usable. Like this one, you get you can get just the natural grip on this one is a full four finger grip. And it's really not that much bigger than the Wilkins. Um, and awesome things about Henders as well, they come in all different colors and, and he makes, the factory makes different options for hardware. So you can customize this to your heart's content. Different colored scales for G10, brass, um, copper hardware, titanium anodized hardware different pocket clips. It's these, these are really fun knives and it's a really good design. If you need a smaller knife, um, I just wish this one wasn't a, uh, solely a flipper. Uh, so a Hinder half track is definitely one I'd be taking a look at it. If, um, this is the kind of blade length that you need to have. Um, so now we'll go down this side. These are some more common knives. This is a Spyderco Techno two. Um, this is a really, really good EDC knife. I like it. Uh, this has a flitanium copper scale on it, so it's a little bit different than what you might see, you know, from the factory because it's going to have a titanium scale over there. And then I've also put a Rips Garage Tech um, titanium pocket clip on this side. Very nice knife. Excellent action. This is made in Taichung, Taiwan. Um, and... Tai Chung is where the best spider coats are coming from. They have the best fit and finish. They're they're very very nice knives. So you know if you're worried about an overseas thing, don't be because they they make the best spider coats. 
So this is one I definitely take a look at. There's also the Techno, the original Techno. Just a little bit different blade shape. Still the same type of size and stuff. This one has been customized. It's had like an acid wash finish on the blade and, and a slight bronze anodizing done on it. Uh, but either one of the Technos from Spyderco, depending on your preference for blade shape and, and whatnot. I prefer the Techno 2. Greatly prefer the Techno 2. Here's another one from Spyderco. This is the Spyderco Dice. This is a weird one. I never would have bought this, but I got a screaming deal on it. I think I paid 65 bucks for this knife with the MXG deep carry pocket clip. Um, and I, I really found myself liking this knife a lot. It's, it's a larger knife in the handle. The handle's actually pretty big. You can see it, it goes way beyond uh, the Wilkins handle there. So it gives you a really nice grip. You can get a full four finger grip on this without using the choil. So you choke up on that choil and you've got a really nice grip on this knife, but it's a smaller blade. And this one opens very easily via the thumb hole. And it also opens very nicely via the flipper. And this one is on bearings as well. So the Spyderco dice might be one that you'd want to look at. Here we have a Zero Tolerance, Zero 900, a Les George collaboration knife. Uh, these are discontinued, but this is one of my favorite Zero Tolerance knives. It's all titanium. It's a little, it's a little heavy. Um, and once again, I do wish that it could open via a thumb stud um, as well as the flipper. The action on it's really nice. It's on bearings though, so it should be. I mean, there's no excuse for it not to be. Uh, but this would be one that you should be looking at if you're looking for something in this blade length. And related to that, this is a Les George ESV upon which the 0900 is based. Uh, ESV is extra small VECP, which is the bigger version of this knife. Uh, this one, which I love, has thumb studs. It is not a flipper. So this one is just on uh, uh, washers, phosphor bonds, washers, instead of ball bearings, and it opens via the thumb stud, which I love. These are just like the Wilkins. This is going to be a super difficult knife to find, though. I, I had to search for about two years before I found one of these for sale. Um, but that's another one in that blade length category that would be a... And something different that not a lot of people are going are gonna to have. Another one we've got here, this is a, in comparison to some of these others, this is a bit of a budget knife uh, compared to the price points you're gonna see on some of these others, although the spider goes aren't terribly expensive, uh, but you're still getting up, you know, 200 bucks or so. Uh, these Enzo Burks, um, these are closer to the $100 and used, I got this one for 85, 75, I think even used. Uh, this has ironwood scales. I've had several different versions of this knife. Uh, they make them in a Scandi grind. This is a full flat grind different blade materials, car or, uh, scale materials, carbon fiber and such. Uh, this is a really good knife. If you're not looking to spend a whole lot, it's a good cutter. It's very well made. The action on it's superb. Um, thumb stud opener, liner lock. This is really a nice one. Um, I'd, I'd recommend one of these. If, if you're looking for something nice, but you don't want to spend too much money on it, that's a, that's a pretty good one. On the other side, we'll take a look at the sky. So this is a collaboration knife. Um, we Knives made this uh, in China, and it's a ferrum forge design. And then what used to be mass drop, they're just called drop now, they um, put this whole thing together. So you can kind of see that the blade is very reflective, so it's difficult to, to get in there. But this is a really, really a, a well-made knife. Uh, it opens well by either the flipper or the or the elongated thumb hole. You can use either one to open it, and it does well. Sorry, it's difficult to do this around the camera, but it's on ball bearings. Uh, this is a Falcon wing edition, so they milled in this little like wing pattern because it's the Ferrum Forge Falcon is how it was marketed. Um, so it, it's a good one, and it's it's got a a nice handle to it. You can get a full four finger grip just like the uh, spider coat dice without the choil and then you you grip on that choil and it's it's nice. So that's a good one. Um, and these weren't terribly expensive. I, I think these were in the 120, 140 range. So that would be one to look at. Here's another bench made. This one is close in blade length. 
to, to the Wilkins. Uh, this is also one that's going to be a little more difficult to find, the Benchmade Bone Collector Series. I've got a whole bunch of these in different sizes, fixed blades, all that. This is the smaller Bone Collector folder. If I can, oh, what's the model number on this? Should be up here by the D2. Yeah. 15030 is the smaller version. 15020 is larger. But this is a really good knife. Uh, it's got a really usable blade shape. The thumb hole is really good for opening it. It's got a good action. Um, the jimping on it is really good. I like that. Th this, these are really nice. Uh, when I first started getting into nice knives um, and started collecting and getting more Benchmades, this was one of my EDCs for a long time. Not this particular one. I have the G10 versions as well. Uh, but this this is a good choice. Uh, they will be difficult to find, but when you do, they're typically not too expensive. You can get them right around that 100 maybe a little more than the 100 sometimes a little less. I got this for 85 bucks, So that's a good choice. And here's a super neat one. It's going to be very difficult to find, but man, these are neat. Graham, John Graham makes these. This is the Graham Razel. So it's got a sharpened edge here, a sharpened edge up here. You can see it's a small knife, but for such a small knife, smaller than this one, it's, you get a solid three finger grip and a pretty good four finger grip on this, despite how small it is. Um, now, a lot of people hate these knives. They think the blade shape is stupid. I own a couple, this is the uh, uh, Grim Razel, or Grim Razel, Graham Razel Stubby Flipper. And I own two of these. I own this one with this purple anodizing and then a, just a stone washed silver one too. And I, I just love his knives. I've got these two, I've got um, a larger folding razel, and then I've got several uh, fixed razels, both from Columbia River Knife and Tool when they were doing a collaboration with him, and then a couple of his um, fixed blades as well. But these are super neat, little tiny knife. Um, it's just a flipper on bearings, so you can't open it via the, a stud or anything, but still, I really like this one. And he also has a very unique pocket clip, which works pretty well. It's a little bit different. I'm not nuts about the pocket clip, but but it works well enough and it's something different. So that's one you can look for, but gonna be very difficult to find those things too. Um, and then the last one we've got up here, this is a Hoback MK Ultra. I really like Hoback stuff. I've got this one and then I've got a, a bigger Quayback and a fixed blade from him too. And he's a really good guy. His knives are really nice. Uh, this MK Ultra, the only bad thing I can give this is that it's a Tanto blade, which I don't feel is all that great for EDC. But it, you know, if you don't mind Tantos, they're they're fine. Uh, but the action on it's really good. It's really well made. This one is a liner lock, so this is something a little bit different. You're not going to see everywhere, and you can get these at a pretty good price. This is a titanium scaled version. There are aluminum scaled versions. Um, I think they were closing these out, the titanium scale versions at Knife Center with this uh, Fallout Black finish for like 225 bucks new. That's a steal for one of these, in my opinion. So that's a good one. Uh, just something different you may want to look at for a smaller bladed knife. Another sub three inch blade I think you should be looking at if you're considering one of these leaf storms is uh, the Chris Reeve Small and Cozy. This one offers the same blade length, maybe a little bit more than the Wilkins offers, but it's going to be at about the same price point, probably even less, uh, especially if you buy one secondhand on the used market. And you're getting that same blade length, but you're getting it in a much smaller package. Overall, the knife's going to have a much smaller footprint in the pocket. It's going to carry a lot more easily. Thickness wise. smaller than the Wilkins. And the Ecozy is a really, it's a surprisingly um, large feeling knife for how small it is and how small it carries. Um, you're not going to get a great four finger grip on it, but you will get a four finger grip. Uh, jumping up there is really good on for the thumb in that position. Uh, this is a good one though. Uh, I'd recommend taking a look at this if you're looking for a sub three inch blade. In conclusion, I'd recommend one of these if, if you can find one on the used market for a decent, decent price. I personally, after having this one, 
I don't think I'd buy a new one because there were enough flaws in this knife. I would be disappointed with it at a new price. Um, I don't see this one leaving my collection because it is something rare. It is something that's neat, and I am going to carry this and use it. Um, but I, you know, keep keep those things in mind that I mentioned. Uh, if you're looking to buy one of these, um, but overall, neat knife, just not a flawless knife. <laughs>